Hello, girls and boys. This is the Gaming Godmother. I've been so caught up on other activities. This is the busiest time of the year for me. And then trying to gather my thoughts about this year's E3 presentation of the Breath of the Wild sequel trailer has had me all tied up in nuts. <laughs> so I won't belabor any long preambles or caveats to this video as we have been given so little information that I feel anyone is entitled to speculate as wildly or as widely as they wish. So brace yourselves. I have many questions. But first, let's take a look at the trailer. It's dark and mysterious and pretty scary looking. And it also looks like Nintendo is addressing our demand for a proper Breath of the Wild dungeon environment. Zelda as an active companion to Link looks pretty promising. And there are portentous indications of information regarding Hyrule cultural history and the role of Ganondorf as the villain in the reunited timeline of the Zeldaverse. So looking at this opening shot, the color palette evokes images of the Twilight Realm and Midna's Tweely garb from Twilight Princess. But these are not Tweely Sheikah symbols. This is something else. This is Gerudo script. Now the mystery deepens. Link and Zelda are clearly equipped for a deep dive into this cavernous realm on a heavily laden pack animal of some sort. There are signposts in the form of wall paintings and carvings that indicate others who might have been here before or have been buried during past cataclysms or, as with the Aztecs and other ancient civilizations, were perhaps subsumed and built upon by encroaching, conquering cultures. This reminds me of the original Planet of the Apes, the movie that is, the answers to how the current situation came about at the surface is both literally and figuratively revealed as we delve below the surface of both the physical setting and the narrative. In both cases, the sequels take a vertical perspective to complement the horizontal exploration we were treated to in the originals. This is depth versus breadth. The question now is how much time will be spent below ground and how much information is buried here. We are given this rapid-fire glimpse into what looks like an expedition that culminates in the reanimation of a corpse, and finally a cataclysmic upheaval that lifts Hyrule Castle by its foundations. Whoa. So look at the caves, look at the temple, look at the wall paintings and the carvings, look at the malice gobbling up that poor rat, look at the giant shadows on the wall, look at the corpse's forehead, that adornment, the mass of red hair, and the oversized shackles on the arms, look at the Gerudo symbol on the cloth-covered slab under the corpse. Is this an altar? Look at the swirling, morphing Gerudo script that spirals upward to the ceiling of this, shall we call it, arena? So where are we and what exactly are we looking at? So this cave painting here depicts what looks like Ganondorf in full ancient armor on horseback. Note the long ponytail. He's wielding a trident. 
And that reminds me of the story of his blasphemous trek across the desert of doubt in Four Swords Adventures. He entered into a pyramid then in order to take a trident that allowed him to, amongst other things, cast souls into the netherworld. And this is also when Ganondorf becomes the beast, Ganon. So I tried to piece together a sequence that would place these images and reference in relation to previous Zelda games, especially to the histories recounted in Breath of the Wild, but I realized there was not enough information to be definite about that. Then other things started to vie for my attention. First, Zelda cut her hair. <laughs> now, some are seeing this as a sign of the possibility for Zelda to be a playable character, and that's totally cool, if not apropos, but I'm not sure that short hair signals this conclusion. I'm just happy that Link has a viable companion and hope she doesn't disappear halfway through the game without a better substitute than this one. And please, Nintendo, give Link some expression. Or is he still an amnesiac? Or does this signal that he is the companion to Zelda? But I digress. I was abruptly struck by the number of images of, well, hands. The white hand grasping the chest of the corpse. Link's hand reaching down to Zelda's. The same white hand grasping Link's arm. The giant stone hand carvings at the entrance to this temple or dungeon or whatever this is. And then there's Link's hand and arm as he receives whatever energy that is coming from the morphing Gerudo spell. The shadow of the white hand vying for dominance against the shadow of a convulsing male figure. Is that demise? And, finally, the twitching, reanimating hand as the corpse comes to life. So now let's take a closer look. The white hand. The scene is one of activity inside what looks like a circular arena or platform with a raised center like an altar very reminiscent of the Yiga hideout entrance and even the entrance to the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time. And emanating from the center is clearly the familiar red malice, the deadly Ganon goop creeping outwards onto the cracked floor. A swirling blue-green string of morphing symbols spirals through this disembodied hand upward towards the ceiling from the chest of this corpse. Between the nexus and the ceiling of what looks like a convergence of Sheikah tech or guardian legs is a string or conduit of the same malice, and all this actively flowing out from the white hand and the chest of the corpse, not in towards them. Is the hand drawing energy from the malice, or is it supplying the magic that barely contains what's oozing from the corpse? And what is the relationship between the corpse, the hand, the magic, the malice, and the Sheikah tech in this instance? The white hand sports an arm brace that is in the design of a stylistically coiled serpent. And the color is that unique coral orange of Midna's hair, which, by the way, itself changes into a hand when she wields her power. We've seen this design before, as reflected in Midna's jewelry, the back of the throne in the Palace of Twilight, but also hinting at the snake motifs of the Desert Colossus in Ocarina of Time and the serpent statues in the Lanayu Spring Cave by Lake Hylia in Twilight Princess, which itself is close to the Gerudo Desert. This speaks to both Twili and Gerudo cultural influences. The image of the White Hand harkens to that of Dead Hand at the bottom of the well and the Shadow Temple in Kakariko Village, itself a Sheikah outpost, and a dying Midna's hand as she reached out to Zelda's and Twilight Princess. These are images of death and the spirits of the dead. Is the white hand reaching from a place of death? And whose hand is it? The same white hand is seen grasping Link's forearm as he falls. Is this to save him or to steal him away? And it is immediately followed by what looks like an overwhelming energy from the Gerudo spell that enters through the palm of Link's right hand and into his arm. Now look at the left hand of the corpse. See that puncture wound? Did the same energy once enter this dead Gerudo in the same manner? Look at the stone hands at the temple dungeon entrance. They are palmed down, gigantic, and reminiscent of Bongo Bongo, who was purportedly an interloper and who was sealed away by Impa, our Sheikah guide and guardian. Are we dealing with interlopers and their magic? Or is it an inversion on the giant palm-up hands of the Desert Colossus, a sort of mockery of the Gerudo goddess of the sands? 
All of these are observations and the ideas they evoke from what I know about past Zelda games. I won't venture much beyond these impressions except to point out that the designs in the fused shadow helmet, a very ancient weapon in Twilight Princess, also indicate a connective thread between these cultures, interlopers, Sheikah and Gerudo, and to point out that the fused shadow was itself created by the ancestors of the interlopers. So who were they? Midna, while using the fused shadow against Ganon, also wielded a trident. Is it the same one as wielded here? And now let's look at the very obvious close-up of the reanimating hand that Zelda is looking at. And she's standing close enough to be touched by the malice, so I'm assuming that it has dissipated at this point. Look at the hand. It has a ring on its index finger. In and of itself, this shouldn't be remarkable. And given that this corpse bears a remarkable resemblance to T.P. Ganondorf, who's wearing all that elaborate headgear and highly decorated armor, I'm still not seeing any rings. But then who needs rings when you have the Triforce of Power, right? I looked for more images of Ganon and Ganondorf. No rings. Nothing on Demise, either. Then I started looking at other Zelda characters with rings. Nothing on Zelda, not Tetra or her pirates, not Midna, not the King of Hyrule, who you'd expect to have one, not Impa, not Riju with all her bangles, her hands are clean, not the cross-dresser at the Karakara Bazaar, not even the jeweler in Gerudo Town. And these ring ensembles don't count because they are an accessory to a costume. The great fairies do sport decorative flower bracelets, which are themselves an attached ensemble rather than solitary rings. As a matter of fact, almost all characters and NPCs in the Zelda series do not wear rings, except these. The fortune teller in Twilight Princess, she wears six and has the Sheikah eye on her forehead. Sarah, the Ordon shopkeeper in Twilight Princess, with four. The barmaid and rebel Telma in Twilight Princess, she wears two. And last of all, with only one ring on her left index finger, is the Gerudo Lady Urbosa in Breath of the Wild. And I'm not counting those fingertip rings as they are secondary to the isolated ring on her hand. So regardless, and whatever this means, the bottom line is that all this hand jewelry is worn by women. So you roll your dubious eyes and ask me, so Gigi, how can this broad-shouldered and muscular body be that of a woman? In spite of the oversized shackles that speak to gigantic arms that at first glance might have been those of someone like Ganondorf or Yuga Ganon or even Demise, I present to you as comparative forensic evidence the physique of Riju's bodyguard, Buliara. Might an equally desiccated corpse of her proportions be mistaken for a man's? Even the skull with the heavy brow might be matched to one such as hers. And while there are known distinctive features that can distinguish between male and female human skeletons, not shown here and which might violate Nintendo's family-friendly policies, I'm still compelled to ask, is this the face of a Gerudo woman? Let's look more closely at our body of evidence. Look at the upper right arm of the corpse. It's wearing an armband unlike any I've seen on any Sheikah or Gerudo, Zora, Hylian, or Goron in any Zelda game. It has swirls, a pattern found on the carved walls in this shot. But this pattern is also evident in the Korok puzzles, the Lome labyrinths. That swirly thing is very much like this swirly peninsula that we've got out there. The whole of the wrist peninsula, and of course in the Faron Zonai temple area in Breath of the Wild. And who is this person wearing such symbols? And maybe we're not looking at a Gerudo. Is this a Zonai? Finally, in a flash, we get a glimpse of what looks like a ritual and a giant shadow cast on the wall in the shape of what looks like demise and the shadow of the white hand, which is no longer disembodied. 
the shadows have no corresponding objects or figures casting them. Is this the representation of Demise or Ganon, his hatred and his curse? What role is the hand playing here? Is this the shadow of an agent of sealing or resurrection? Or is this rather the shadow of the never-ending struggle to either seal or reanimate Ganon, his spirit, and his wrath? And speaking of wrath, I was reminded of Verbosa's spiritual gift to Link, the power of her fury, a force emanating from her being and used as an avenging weapon through Va Naboris. Now the divine beast, fully activated, harnessed a power that could only be directed by spiritual energy. Urbosa's anger towards Ganondorf and what he had done to her people and the world festered for a hundred years before imparting that energy to Link. Could Urbosa's power be uniquely connected to Demise's curse? Can that curse inhabit the mind and body of anyone the way that the champions could impart their energy to Link? I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but it feels as if there may be a connection between the champion's power and Ganon's power that has nothing to do with the Triforce. The English mistranslation of Zelda's words during the final cutscenes in Breath of the Wild can have a radical effect on how reincarnation is treated by Western reviewers of the game. If, as the Japanese original says, Ganon was obsessed with reincarnation, why was there not a corporal Ganondorf in Breath of the Wild? But if we take the Western translation that he gave up on reincarnation, then any form of Ganon's spirit of hatred, as with Calamity Ganon and his blights, could manifest itself in anything, like the Guardians, or in any one, like Urbosa, or someone else. And did Demise's curse include the hero depicted in the tapestry shown as Impa and Cass recited the history of ancient Hyrule? While it has been assumed the hero in the tapestry is Link, could it be that, in fact, this is Ganondorf, as some have suggested? Or is that a female warrior? Or the original Gerudo champion? Look at the arm of the hero. The hand glows white with the power that we saw infusing Link. The red hair flows from the face and head. Could that figure be wearing a red Gerudo veil, for instance, taking the role of the hero and attacking Calamity Ganon as a mighty Gerudo warrior would if she had been given the chance? So, I could go on with other things I noticed, like the raised altar and its similarity to the entrance of the Yiga hideout, or that of the Shadow Temple, as sites of ritual association with death and resurrection. The swirling pattern in the floor of the final boss arena and the Wind Waker, and its resemblance to the swirling spell and the vortex that may literally be Wrist Peninsula. Or, if this is an arena... Is this the Arbiter's Grounds beneath the Gerudo Sands where many Gerudo and others died and were sealed away to other realms? Or I could speculate on the history of the ancient Zonai and how they might fit into this narrative. How the Twili might have been involved. But we need more information. I believe that we might be dealing with a revelation of some sort of Twili slash interloper slash Zonai connection to Shika slash Gerudo ritual magic or some kind of conjuring, and this person is being used as a conduit of ancient power tied to either resurrection or sealing rituals involving the curse of demise. And again, I return to the question, who is this corpse? I can't help thinking why the origins of the powers of the champions are not discussed in Breath of the Wild. How did they come by them? And note that, as with Zelda, the palm of the hand is where the champion's power emanates. Are the champions connected to what we are seeing here? Are they related to perhaps the seven heroines? Is this the remains of the eighth heroine? Or are we looking at this guy, Hugo, from A Link Between Worlds? Or is this simply Ganondorf and the garb just a decoy? So that's my two bits, girls and boys, on this little clip. Even if I'm way out there at this stage, it should be okay to stretch the imagination with these tidbits. Uh, is it simply what it looks like? A male Gerudo? Ganondorf? Mm, I'm thinking this corpse is not Ganondorf from Twilight Princess. The hole in the corpse's left hand, the ring, and the armband design raise questions about its cultural origins as well as its gender. 
I'll be speculating some more surrounding the Zonai interloper Tweedly presence in the sequel as we see what else Nintendo comes up with in the way of clues. They'll be juicy, I'm sure. Feel free to comment and share. Just keep it civil and open-minded, okay? Later. And register to vote. <laughs> Thank you.